This is the second in my series of videos on modes of production. In the first one, I dealt with the Neolithic Revolution, the transition to agriculture, or to horticulture at least. In the second one, I'm dealing with the beginnings of the transition to class society and the rise of patriarchy. Now, according to historical materialism, there's a relationship between economic surplus and class. A precondition for the formation of classes in a society is that there's got to be a food surplus. But this is not enough by itself to create classes. A food surplus by itself might just extend the division of labour, allow some people to specialise in, in non-agricultural work, some of them to be potters, some to be smiths, etc. And a society with farmers, smiths and potters is not as such a class society, even if the trades become hereditary, since the relationship between the trades would still be one of equals. There wouldn't be any exploitation at that point. Class formation requires more than this. It requires that at least part of the food surplus goes to support a group of people who are no longer engaged in physical production. And this non-productive status has to be something that is inherited and passed down through the generations. Now, in addition to consuming more food, the upper classes had a disproportionate share of other goods, clothes, jewellery, utensils, ornaments, etc. So the surplus they consume is not just a su food surplus. It's a general surplus. It's a surplus of the general labour product. And food surplus is just a precondition for this general surplus existing. It. Because if there wasn't a food surplus, there'd be no food for, for craftsmen. And if only enough cloth was produced to clothe the working population, then the rulers would go naked. If emperors have got clothes, there must be a food surplus. If kings are shodden, there must be a leather surplus. So that surplus moves beyond just being a matter of food and becomes a surplus of other products as well. One can look at this diagrammatically, start off with a subsistence food economy where everyone grows the food they need themselves. The formation of a food surplus starts to allow craft workers and as the food surplus gets bigger you can have more craft surplus, more craft workers and some of the food is going to the craft workers, some of the food now goes to a non-labouring class and they then consume part of the output of the craft workers. But that by itself isn't enough. Lots of things are needed. A class society requires a surplus, but the reverse isn't necessarily the case. A food surplus doesn't necess necessitate an exploiting class. To do that, you need other misfortunes. You need war patriarchy, and religion. The sequence is population expands and uses up free land. You then get conflict over resources and this gives rise to the warrior role. In small communities this means raiding, raping and capturing women. From this arises the patriarchy and the subordination of women and from it also arises the capture of men to work as slaves so that you get the transition from an initially egalitarian society to a patriarchal slave economy as the next stage. Now there are laws of statistics behind this and it's to do with how community size affects its reproduction. You have to realise that in any community, the basic reproductive resource 
are the young women in the community. The rest of the community doesn't contribute to its reproductive capacity. And in small communities, typical of the stage when some agriculture or horticulture exists, but not enough of the protein sources are coming from that. There is still some hunting for protein and hunting tends to maintain a low um, population density so that these agricultural settlements are widely separated and relatively small in number. Under these circumstances, the number of young women in a community fluctuates for statistical reasons. I've drawn some graphs here of this is the expected number of girls in the next generation if you have a community of 20 families. I'm, I'm taking the number of women in the previous generation as the number of families. Um, this is the probability distribution if you have eight families. And basically this is a cumulative binomial distribution. I'm assuming that each woman has two children surviving to adulthood. Now, what these graphs tell you is if you project up, you can see what the probability of a shortfall is. So suppose we take a community of eight families. They would end up with fewer than six young women in the next generation about a quarter of the time. But a shortfall of four women in this small community imply, that is to say, a ratio of six women to um, ten men in the next generation implies a shrinkage of the population by a quarter which would threaten the survival of the, the, the community. So the actual survival of these small communities requires some mechanism to exist whereby women can be brought into that village. Communities with randomly low numbers of girls will have a strong pressure to get girls to migrate from neighbouring communities for them to survive. And we know historically this took two forms. The first was rape or capture of women, with the word rape in its original Latin sense meaning seizure, and the other was the purchase of brides in exchange for cattle. And that of course it wasn't possible in the areas where cattle hadn't been domesticated. And the net effect of this, either of those mechanisms, is to impose a transition from matrilocality, which was characteristic of hunting and gathering societies and the first stages of the Neolithic transition, to patrilocal societies, where successive generations live in the household of the male ancestor. Now, if we take the case of capture, the captured brides are going to be initially subordinate to the matriarch or mother-in-law and then become subordinate to their husband. They're subordinate to the matriarch because they're not her daughters. They've been brought in by the sons of the village. And this undermines the general principle of equality of the sexes in the society. And the principle of capture also undermines equality within the community because the captured wives are a subordinate group and as such it prepares the cultural conditions for the capture of slaves. Now if instead of the wives coming in by warlike capture, there is an exchange of cattle between the communities. That the village which gives up part of its reproductive potential is compensated by the receipt of cattle. What happens then is that the community that buys brides in exchange for cattle enters into a contract to the effect that the 
children of the bride that comes into the community will be members of her new tribe, not her original tribe. That has to be the case because that is the motivation for bringing in the brides. And this undermines matrilineal descent. Since those children are no longer the children of her own mother's tribe. They become children of a tribe different from their mother. Or lineage group different from their mother. At the same time, the actual purchase of women provides the general cultural background for the purchase of slaves and it establishes the idea that people can be property and it establishes the practice of, for instance, blood money, compensation of one tribe for another in terms of cattle if one person is killed. So what we see here is a contradiction. The initially egalitarian matrilineal society, once it transitions to settled agriculture, generates internal contradictions that nullify its initial conditions of existence. And this is a general feature of the transitions between social forms. The combination of the society and its mode of existence in the environment generates in time contradictions which lead to the abolition of that social form. Now, how can it be resolved? The basic uh, contradiction associated with small matrilineal communities could have been solved two ways. They could have become more exclusively agricultural or piscatorial whilst growing in size so that it's possible to form big matrilineal or even matriarchal communities that don't suffer from this frequent random shortages of women of childbearing age. Larger communities like Katalhoyuk in Anatolia would not have suffered from these fluctuations in sex numbers. And this may be a reason why they were able to maintain an apparently egalitarian matriarchal structure for many thousands of years. The alternative path is to move towards a patrilineal and subsequently patriarchal form of family and clan structure. And we know empirically that in most cases, path two was more common. Now, at the same time as patriarchy and hierarchy and domestic slavery were um, developing, you get the rise of vengeful gods, belief in vengeful gods. And the early stages of class, sacra, class society are marked by the most brutal forms of religion, with human sacrifice as the most terror-inducing form of religion. Studies in, in a paper in, in Nature I'm citing, um, a statistical study of 93 different types of human cultures from anthropological records showed that 43% of these cultures carried out human sacrifice. Now only a quarter of the egalitarian societies carried out human sacrifice, uh, whereas 67% of the highly stratified societies carried out human sacrifice. And the anthropologists argue that this is evidence that human sacrifice was a form of terror used to support the establishment of, of hierarchy and patriarchy. Now that's the end of this uh, video. It's one of a series I'm doing uh, as background to my book, How the World Works. Uh, since I have a royalty-free contract with MR to allow the books to be sold cheaply, um, I, won't, I don't make any money out of the book, but if you want to support my work, I do have a, a Patreon channel.